The Old Testament reading is Samuel chapter 8, beginning with the first verse. When Samuel became old, <clears throat> he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Bathsheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside from gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all of the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in the ways, in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to govern us like all the nations. But <clears throat> things displeased Samuel when they said, Come, give us a king to govern us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken to the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they not, have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them, according to all the deeds which they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaken me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, hearken to their voice only. <clears throat> you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the war of the Lord to the people who were asking a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your men servants and your maid servants and the best of your cattle and asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king whom you have been chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we always may be like all the nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them to the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, hearken to their voice and make them a king. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The other day, someone said to me, um, I understand you have a PhD in religion. I said, well, yes. They said, uh, what, what was your area of focus? I said, it was the Old Testament. And this person, rather indelicately, I would say, said, I hate the Old Testament. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. It's sort of like saying, you know, your middle child is ugly or something. How should I say it? The Old Testament is God's firstborn scripture. The New Testament would be God's secondborn scripture. They're both God's children. They're both God's word. When Jesus taught from the Bible, he taught from what we call the Old Testament. That's what Mary taught him when he was a little boy, where, the, where she found her songs to sing to him. When the gospel writers wrote the story of Jesus, they had a copy of the Old Testament open before them. 
I think about the Old Testament. I think everything I knew when I was a child about the Bible came out of the Old Testament. Stories like Jonah and the whale and Daniel and the lion's den and David and Goliath. All those stories come out of the Old Testament. I was blessed with a professor when I was a Duke. He was my favorite professor, became really my life mentor. He was a professor of Old Testament. And if you'd ever seen him, you would never say you hate the Old Testament because he would hold open the Bible. His lectures were scintillating, but just the way he would read the Bible, he would read a passage like this one that we just heard, and after he would read it, he, he was a big man, he would, he would sort of give it this deep groan from inside, like, mmm. It was like a bear chomping down on a piece of meat or something, like, mmm, oh, it's good. And it's good, because what we find in the Old Testament is all this psychological depth and complexity. You see characters who are from broken families and people that are confused and their hearts are broken and they're trying to make sense out of God. And it's the nitty-gritty of life, and it's just absolutely lovely, and we learn so much. Today's story is a wonderful example. Here you have, here you have Samuel. And Samuel has raised two sons, and they are, they are a colossal disappointment to him. He hopes that they will be the next leaders of Israel, but they're just not up to it. They're evil. They're wicked. You can imagine how crushed he was by that. But then he has to deal with these people who come to him, <laughs> and they, they preface their request by saying, Samuel, you are old. Like, you're always happy to be told this, right? Like, there's one Harris Teeter I will not go to, because the one time I went there, they said, do you want the senior citizen discount? No. I say, Samuel, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Like, it's hard enough that his sons are a huge disappointment to him, but like everybody else knows. It's a problem for everybody else. Imagine how devastating that was for him. But then they ask something that's theologically problematical. They say, we want to have a king to fight our battles. We want to have a king like all the other nations. And you see, the Israelites were really strange. All the other nations did have kings, but Israel had this long tradition that they, they just didn't have government. They didn't have a standing army. What they relied on, <laughs> go figure, like this for national policy, their national policy was, we'll count on God to deliver us. And God had any number of times. You have the instance of Gideon. The Midianites are about to crush the Israelites. God raises up Gideon. He defeats the Midianites, saves Israel, and they come to him and say, we want you to be king over us, be King Gideon. And Gideon says, not in Israel. We don't have kings. Only the Lord is our king. And if we propose that as a policy for the United States of America, we'd get laughed out of here in no time, right? I mean, as dissatisfied as we are with our politicians and our government and our bureaucracy, we want one. We want a standing army. We want some bureaucrats. We want somebody doing something. We want a police force or whatever it is we want. We want some government. We think we need that. It's so interesting. The people ask Samuel for this. So Samuel tells God, I wonder how that happened. Like, how do you go tell God something and hear what God says? You'd love to get that down. And Samuel tells God, and God says, warn them how it will be, and then let them have a king. That's amazing, isn't it? God doesn't want them to have a king, but God says, let them have one. He warns them how it'll be. He'll take your sons and your daughters and the best of your crops. You'll be really sorry that you had a king. It will really oppress you, and you'll wind up in all kinds of wars, and you'll lose your sons in battle, and you'll really grieve this, but God's willing to let them have it. That's amazing to me. God gives us all this space. God lets us have what we want. And in America, you think that's good. I get what I want, but it's not always good to get what you want. The Israelites asked for king. They got what they asked for, and it was not good. God's so strange with this. In Romans, the way Paul puts it is Paul says, God gave them up to the desires of their heart. It's like the life that we want is the life that we get. God doesn't miraculously shield us from it or make us have the holy life that God wants us to have. We wind up with the society that we ask for. I mean, in our society, we complain about it all the time. But as I've said before, like people complain about what's on TV. If people didn't watch it, it wouldn't be on TV. They put it on there because that's what people watch. People complain about movies. Those are the movies that people go to see. When there's a nice, sweet movie about morality, no one attends. In our country, we want things like freedom of speech. We've got it. 
In our country, we want things like winners. We want winners. In sports, we want winners. And then we're shocked when somebody's cheating behind the scenes. I won't name the school in question at the moment, but <laughs> we're puzzled. By, and what we forget is, is we go for the freedoms, but we forget about the formation that has to go into the freedom so that the freedom can actually be good instead of just random and crazy. People ask for king. God lets them have a king. It's interesting what we see in this story is how much our political frustration grows out of that darkness in the human heart. We get it wrong in America every time. We think, if we just get the right president next time, everything will be great. Wrong. This is incorrect. Our country is full of people who have darkness in their hearts, as do all other countries. We live in a flawed, fallen world. Our political frustration goes out of our separateness from God. It grows out of, according to this text, our desire to be like the other nations. <laughs> this is so interesting. Israel is not supposed to be like the other nations. Israel is supposed to be set apart. They're not supposed to try to be like everybody else. Uh, as a story I may have told you before. I, actually, I had a dream last night where I said what I just said. This is a story I may have told you before, and somebody in the congregation in my dream said, well, then don't tell it. <laughs> but I shall tell it. And it goes like this. In about the year 1969, for about two months, inexplicably, Nehru jackets were in style. <laughs> this is hard to believe, and if you're younger than I am, you don't even know what I'm talking about, but you can't imagine tackier clothing. But for a while, all the boys were wearing these Nehru jackets. So I went home to my mother, and I said, please, 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 I want a Nehru jacket. And she said, why do you want a Nehru jacket? And I said, all the other boys are wearing them. And she said, well, if all the other boys jumped off the cliff, would you jump after them? I still wanted the Nehru jacket, but I didn't get one. The next day, a new refrigerator arrives at our home. They're installing it. I, my mother is admiring it. I asked her, why did we get the new refrigerator? The old one was fine. She said, it has an ice maker. I said, why do we need an ice maker? She said, oh, everyone has an ice maker now. <laughs> I took my life in my hands, and I said, mother, if all the other mothers jumped off a cliff, <laughs> This did not go well for me. <laughs> we try to be like somebody, and God says, be different, be special. I made you to be special. I made you to be set apart. We actually know set apart, don't we? Like, like you live in an exclusive neighborhood, or you, or you join a country club or something. Like, we like being set apart, but God's idea is you be set apart for God, right? Imagine being part of a group that it, it's set apart for, oh, you don't have to imagine it, you are. That's what the church is. We are those who are set apart for God. It is to be God's agenda that is our privilege, and we miss this so often because we're so busy with, with our agenda. I, I was studying for the sermon this week, and I came across a quote in, from a scholar named Robert Barron. It's beautiful words. Listen to this. He says, a person's plan might be bold, beautiful, magnanimous, and popular, but still not be God's plan. A person's ambition might be admirable and selfless, but still not be congruent with God's ambition. Our lives are not about us. God's plans for us are always greater, more expansive, and more life-giving than our plans for ourselves. Isn't that something? Like, you're doing good things. Surely God's happy that you're doing good things, but God actually wants you to ask God, what, what do you want me to do? Because a good thing you might be doing might not actually be the good thing God's asking you to do. God might actually ask you not to do some good, grand thing that people will admire and that you'll get praise and glory for because God has something else that God wants you to do, and the world never gets it. I thought this week about Henry, Henry Nouwen, great spiritual writer. I've got dozens of his books. You may as well. Just a wonderful writer. Everything he wrote was just gold. Wonderful man. And he was a world-famous theologian. He lectured at Yale and Harvard and in Europe. He was amazing. But he kept praying to God, what do you want me to do with the rest of my life? As he was about my age, a little bit younger. And God somehow told him that God wanted him to move to this group home where they take care of severely handicapped adults, and his job in that home was going to be to care for one man named Adam. And so he did that, and people questioned him like, you're Henry Nowen? You should be traveling the world. You're a world-famous theologian. You should be, I don't know, something huge and important. But 
said God was calling him to care for this one man, and who's to say that's less, that that's not of God? In fact, God's call very often is something small that the world doesn't understand. It's Jesus' way always, isn't it? Something that's small. Uh, Lisa and I went to Theater Charlotte and saw the production of Jesus Christ Superstar, Ellen Robinson doing a wonderful job with the music, and it's really an exploration of what does it mean to be a king, what is power about, what is glory about, and everyone around Jesus is puzzled about his take on glory and on power, and I love the moment where Jesus is hauled before Pontius Pilate, and he sings, he sings to Jesus, he says, you look so small, not like a king at all. Jesus was small, but Jesus' way is always small. That, that's the Lord of the Rings secret, right? If you know the Lord of the Rings, it, it's, it's not Sauron and the mighty powers that win the day, but it's just those little hobbits, those little short people. And they, they win the day not by seizing power, but by getting rid of the power. Frodo holds that ring of power. Instead of thinking, oh, I'll be in charge, I could do this, it's, it's destroy the ring. Destroy the power. Power corrupts. Power corrupts. God calls us to be humble. God calls us to serve. God calls us to small things. I loved hearing Ashley Douglas's service sermon at the last service. I should have yielded my time to you and let you do it again. It was absolutely marvelous. You can catch it online. She was preaching a great sermon at the end. She was grateful for her time here and was talking about that. And what was fascinating to me is she didn't talk about any big things. She talked about little things like what it's like that we get to do that we take a prayer shawl that some of you get together and knit and we can take it to somebody in the hospital and we can say, here. And it's just a piece of cloth, right? We have all these ministries that seem to be something small. You know, you can buy jewelry anywhere, but you can go to Fashion and Compassion over in Dilworth, and this is cool. You can buy just, just a little necklace. It's kind of nothing, and it's not expensive, but, but it's made by a woman who's been abused, and she's getting out of something like sex trafficking, and, and, and when you buy it, some money goes toward that ministry, and it's just one piece of jewelry, and it's just one person, and that doesn't really fix her life, but it, it's a small thing. I was interviewed the other day about freedom schools. We have freedom schools beginning. We need volunteers. You'll want to respond to that. It's one of the coolest things they do every summer, helping kids with literacy through the summer. It's just a marvelous program. We're one of the leading churches in the city. We've been doing it for 10 years now. It's great. And I was interviewed at, by a video producer the other day about why, ch why our church cares about freedom school, and I was doing my best. It was actually interesting. Um, she asked me three questions, and then on the fourth questions, I said whatever I said, and she said, good answer. I thought, well, what about the first three? I mean, <laughs> she asked me something that I did not expect. She said, what is your single favorite memory from Freedom School? I knew what it was. It was a couple of years ago. Lisa and I had tickets, and we went down to Blumenthal to see The Lion King. I actually had seen The Lion King in Blumenthal before, a number of years ago. Great production, staging, music. It's incredible, isn't it? But that night that we went, it was special to us to go because our church... <laughs> had sprung for tickets to fill about two-thirds of the place full of Freedom School scholars, right? You didn't know that. I took your money and bought tickets. You haven't thanked me for it either. And uh, so we're there, and it's just a different crowd from what you usually have at Blumenthal, because a lot of these kids, they've never set foot in Blumenthal. They've never seen a Broadway show, any of this stuff. And so we're there, and the show starts, and there would be some especially big number, and I, I how you know, regular patrons, when this happens, they go, that night, there were, I mean, gasps from these kids. And you could say, it's one night, it's one show. Does that really change anybody's life? And the only answer I can give to you is absolutely. Some kids saw The Lion King. That's something small, but Jesus, the King, it's always about something small. Martin Luther said that God became small for us in Christ. He showed us his heart so that our hearts might be one. The people come to Samuel. They break his heart and say, give us a king. And God says, let them have a king. <laughs> God's too good to just let them be ruined by that. So what God does is God lets them have some kings, and they are disasters, and they're hugely disappointed in all of them. And then God says, 
let's get this thing right. So he sends a little infant down to the town of Bethlehem in the middle of nowhere, and there's a cry in the middle of the night in the dark. There wasn't even room for them in the inn. And there's the cry of God Almighty saying, the king has come. So small, not a king at all, and yet the king of kings, something small. Thanks be to God.